folks, welcome to the show. Fun fact about me you might not know. My favourite Disney movie of all time is Oliver and Company. Though I can't really blame you for not figuring it out. I mean, I have been pretty subtle about it. Let's roll back to the mid-80s, an era which I, a 19-year-old, am clearly qualified to talk about. At this time, the Walt Disney Feature Animation Studio was in trouble. It had been almost 20 years since Walt's death, and the animation department still hadn't really recovered from the loss. Some movies, like The Rescuers and Fox and the Hound, did decently well at the box office, but nothing was reaching the worldwide phenomenon status that so many movies from the 50s and 60s received. With, obviously, the most prominent example being the huge box office failure that was The Black Cauldron, which put the animation division on thin ice as they were forced out of their building and off the Disney lot entirely. The movies that were once the lifeblood of the company were now starting to be seen as expendable, as live action movies like Splash were where most of the company's film revenue was coming from. Something needed to change, and it needed to change fast. In 1986, the studio released The Great Mouse Detective, which, while not a smash hit, looked like the highest grossing movie in the world next to The Black Cauldron. And that was enough to keep the studio moving forward onto the next film, a contemporary adaptation of Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist now set in late 80s New York, starring a cast of quadrupeds. Now, as much as I'd love to go in-depth about the movie's development, there's one issue with that. We know nothing about it. Here's everything we know about the making of Oliver and Company. It was originally pitched in Greenland at the first Disney Gong show in 1985. At one point, it was a sequel to The Rescuers. We know a few small details about earlier drafts and some of the actors who were considered for the characters. For example, Tom Cruise was offered the role of Dodger, and Patrick Stewart was offered the role of Francis. And that's it. Outside of those tiny bits of info, all we ever got was a six minute making of featurette. Now, you're all probably thinking, Disney movies always have deleted scenes, right? Surely Oliver and Company had some. And you'd be right, they did have some. But because of the stressful time the animators went through, almost every storyboard that was cut from the movie was torn up and or thrown away because the animators found it therapeutic. Which, I mean, couldn't they have just bought a stress ball, as opposed to destroying things I would sell my soul to see? And so, on November 18th, 1988, the film released and was a huge success, going on to be the first animated film to gross $100 million worldwide upon its initial release. So, yeah, this movie is pretty important to animation history. And that's not the only reason. The opening number, Once Upon a Time in New York City, was the first ever Disney song written by the legend Howard Ashman, who would go on to write the music for Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Aladdin. But of course, the documentary that got released on Disney Plus a while back glossed over this tiny bit of inconsequential information, instead opting to show us the same Little Mermaid pitch meetings that we've seen on, what is it? five other documentaries? Which didn't annoy me in the slightest. It was the first animated movie to have an entire department dedicated to computer animation, where basically every moving object that wasn't the characters was CG. The movie was Disney's trial attempt at bringing back the animated musical structure, which the company hadn't attempted since the Aristocats 18 years prior. Top that off with a huge line of merchandise and a soundtrack that sold insanely well, and it's no wonder why Oliver and Company was the catalyst to Disney animation moving forward with their plans to release one new animated movie per year, which today we know as the Disney Renaissance. So we have a movie that reinvigorated Disney feature animation, made a huge profit, and has been outright stated to have put the company's faith back in animation. Which means it's time to ask the age-old question, why can't I walk into the Disney store right now and pick up an Oliver & Company mug, phone case, and stationery like I can for Hercules? So the first reason being the movie unfortunately shares its anniversary with a niche cartoon character you've probably never heard of. I I think he's called Michael Moose or something. Yep, Oliver and Company was released on the anniversary of Steamboat Willie, which basically doomed the movie's legacy right then and there. But the real nail in the coffin was the tiny mer person in Jamaican Crab movie, which was released exactly one day to a year later and completely set the world on fire, making Oliver and Company's outstanding success look mediocre at best. The only real legacy the movie left behind is this image of Roy E. Disney standing in front of some storyboards from the film, as it is easy easily the most iconic and widely used photo of the man. And that was all she wrote. The other Disney Renaissance movies went on to get director home video sequels, TV spin-offs, heck, some even got Broadway adaptations. Meanwhile, Oliver and Company is lucky enough if it gets to be included in those 365 bedtime storybooks. But towards the end of the 2010s, something started to change. Slowly but surely, new merchandise was being released, and it wasn't by Disney. It was by this company known as Loungefly. Suddenly there were Oliver and Company bags, t-shirts, wallets, light up pins, everything I ever wanted but will never be able to get because as said before, I live in the UK and 
import charges have only gotten worse and worse to a point where I'm now paying more for the shipping than I am the actual thing. This isn't a new thing either. Disney movies have done this for years. Did you know that Pinocchio, Fantasia and Dumbo were originally box office disappointments? How about Alice in Wonderland, Sleeping Beauty, Robin Hood? All movies that today we consider essential classics, but didn't give the best first impressions. The clear pattern here is about 20 to 30 years after the movie's release. It starts to get a huge boost in popularity, and I think we are now at the point where those movies from the 70s and 80s are starting to gain more relevance. Robin Hood, Fox and the Hound, heck, even the Black Cauldron are starting to see this resurgence. And even though I never expect Walk Around Oliver and Company characters to return to the parks, I do feel we're kind of getting to a turning point in terms of how Disney treats this property. And maybe in the coming years, we'll start seeing the characters gradually making more appearances, which for someone whose obsession with this film has only gotten deeper over the past 13 years since I first saw it, that makes me excited for whatever the future has in store. Needless to say, Oliver and Company is an extremely special and personal movie to me, and even though as time goes on, I start to see more of its faults, I will never stop loving this movie. And something tells me pretty soon it's going to start to get at least a fraction of the attention it rightfully deserves. Thanks for watching, folks. See you real soon.